Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear a conversation between an applicant and an embassy employee about a visa. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. I'm planning a trip to Thailand soon and I'd like to make a visa application, please. I'm going later on in the year, so I'd like to apply now. I was told I could do that here in person or online, but I preferred to come in. Of course. Do you know which type of visa you would like to apply for? Well, um, I read some information on your website, but I'm still not sure. There seem to be so many different types. You're right, there are. But there are two popular, more common ones. What are the main differences between them? The business visa lasts for 90 days. This is for people coming to begin work or do business in the country. The other one, which is for people going on holiday or for medical treatment, lasts 60 days. Are you planning on travelling for work or pleasure? I'm actually going to visit a friend who works over there, so for pleasure. I'll be doing a lot of travelling and sightseeing, I imagine. OK, so you need the tourist visa. There are several things you need to make the application. Now, depending on your situation, we might have to ask you for additional documents, such as a birth certificate or driving licence, but we do need to see a passport in all cases. I've got that here with me, and I've also taken a copy of it for you. I thought it might be necessary. Let me see. I'm afraid you will need to apply for a new one. This one runs out in November, which is in five months, and it has to have at least six left on it for the visa application. Right, I see. OK, I can do that. What else? You need to complete this tourist visa application form and attach two photographs, too. Do you have any passport photos? No, but when I apply for my new passports, I will get some. Do they need to be the same size? Exactly the same. They must be recent too, but that won't be a problem if you're getting some done anyway. Next thing is to complete the application form. OK, let's see. Um... Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Would you be able to help me complete it? Of course. Let's have a look. Right, so fill in all your personal information. Great. Nationality is British, surname is Johnston, and first name is Alan. Can I just confirm your middle name? It's not very clear on the form. Is that Senmore? S-E-N? No, sorry, it's my handwriting. It should say Seymour. That's S-E-Y-M-O-U-R. Thank you. I've got that now. So we also need your mobile number. Could I make a note of it? Sure. It's 07822953. 07. OK, so that's 07822 007. No, sorry, it's 953007. Got it. Everything seems to be in order in that section of the form. Let's have a look at the next part, about previous travel to the country. 
Yes, do I need to complete that section, or is that only for long-term visas? No, no, you have to complete it. So the first point asks if you have traveled to Thailand before. Yes, but it was many years ago, in 1992 and 1990... Let me think, um, 1996. No, wait, that was the year I traveled to Vietnam. 1998. Okay. And when are you going to travel to Thailand this time? The date you give me must be no more than three months after the issue date of the visa. I understand. Well, I'm supposed to be there for my friend's birthday in September. And when exactly is your friend's birthday? 15th of September. Let's put down the first of that month, so you've got plenty of time to travel to the wedding. Great. And what about this last part on the form? Here. It asks about departure from Thailand. What should I write there? If you're going to travel to another country after Thailand, instead of returning to England, you just need to write that in the space. My friend and I are talking about going on to Bali after Thailand, but really I think I'm going to come back home to England. He might go to Bali alone. Okay, so we can fill that part in. And that's everything. Now come back again with your new passport as soon as you have it, and we can issue your visa. Thanks a lot for your help. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear a salesman talking about the features of a new accommodation building. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the launch of the new accommodation building, Park Heights, situated in this lovely little community. My name is Steve James and I'm the sales manager. There are 40 apartments here with four distinct styles in an exclusive private community. Today, I'm going to tell you a little about the building, the area, and the apartments that we have for sale. All of this area was, in the past, an industrial district, but now it is being completely redeveloped. The old metal production factory building next door is now a leisure complex with shops, cafes, bars, and even a cinema. The old warehouse for storing machinery has now been transformed into this apartment building, and the surrounding delivery and transport areas have been turned into a beautiful green park. We began building work here five years ago, and all of the buildings have been finished to a very high standard. If you just go out of the exit to the complex down there, there is a sports centre where you can enjoy a range of keep fit activities. We have also developed a number of properties in this area, and when I speak to some of the residents there, the thing that lots of people say they most enjoy about the area is being close to the countryside. And you can see that the buildings are surrounded by trees here. But for those of you that do need to travel into the city, there are great transport options. The bus stop is five minutes walk away, and there are bus links to all over the city. Also, a new train station recently opened and now links the area to the centre of the city in 20 minutes. Most of the apartments do come with car parking, but not all of them, I'm afraid. But wherever you park your car, you will be able to drive to the International Airport in less than an hour. I'm sure that some of you have looked at lots of apartments around the city, and you may be asking, what makes these flats so different? Well, 
They are in a building with a lot of history, but so are converted lofts, warehouses and factories all over the city. It is also fairly standard these days to have the kind of facilities that we offer here. What we have that's unique is the sustainable lifestyle you will be able to enjoy here. Most of the power comes from solar panels on the roof. The buildings are designed to reuse rainwater and use less electricity for heating and light. As well as this, our residents in similar locations all say they value the 24-hour security that helps to reduce crime and makes them feel safe. That and the warm attitude of all our staff and fellow residents make it a great place to live. Before the talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. OK, so let me tell you about some of the different apartments that we have in this building. We have four different styles. The courtyard view, garden view, canal view and penthouse. The cheapest are the courtyard view flats. These properties are for single people or couples. All of the other flats that you can choose are larger and also have access to a private car park and the building's communal swimming pool. The next flats are called garden view flats. These ones are a little more spacious and, as you will see, are beautiful two-bedroom properties that have spacious open-plan living and kitchen areas. Then we have the first of our family flats which are larger with three bedrooms, a separate kitchen, and all of them have large balconies that look out over the canal at the back of the building, which is how they get their name. The final flats are the penthouses. There are only two of them, and they are on the top of the building. They offer luxurious accommodation and their own private entrance, which nobody else can access. Now, if you'd like to come with me, I'll show you our show homes, which are just down this corridor and to the left. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. You will hear a discussion between a student and a tutor about a recent work placement. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi James, this is our first face-to-face -face tutorial in a while and I just wanted to check in with you after your work placement. OK, it's all been really useful, I think. And you've been working for a manufacturing company, is that right? Yes, they make baby products, actually. Sounds interesting. Tell me about why you chose to work there. Well, actually, it was my first choice. Everybody else was applying to the software company, and I thought that I might not get it. I didn't really care about the products in the baby company, but what interested me the most was that it's a huge multinational company, and I thought it would be a really interesting experience working for an organisation like that. And do you think you made the right choice? 
Well, yes and no. I mean, probably the best bit of working for a company like that is that there's so much stuff going on in terms of market analysis, which I've always been interested in, but also research and development, product and design, and lots of stuff that I've never really thought of before. It sounds like it was all good. Well, yes, but I also think that if I'd chosen to do my placement with a smaller company, I'd have been able to make more of an impact. I just sometimes felt that the stakes were so high there. Everything involved huge amounts of money, and that stopped people taking risks or allowing someone like me to have any real impact on the tasks. Yes, that can sometimes be the case. It's useful to get some feedback. Do you think it was well organised? Oh, yes, it was great. I had a mentor the whole time who I could ask if I had any problems. So even as I moved around departments and had different managers, I always had the same person to talk to if I had any problems. Good. Well, I look forward to reading about it in your reflective portfolio. That's what I wanted to talk to you about, actually. I'm not really sure how to go about it. OK, well, I can help you with that. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 25 to 30. Do you have your notes? Yes, here they are. Um, so what I'm not really sure about is how to structure it. Well, what you need to start by doing is looking at the module handbook. This tells you the knowledge and skills that you have to demonstrate. If you take notes on these things, then you will have the content that you need. OK, I'll have a look at that again. That's good to know. But I'm still not sure about the structure. Is it like an essay? No, the portfolio has a different structure. I don't really want to tell you exactly how to do it, as there are different ways that are good for different people. After organising your notes, you could go to the library and look at the student assignment there from last year. It's in the section near the study skills books. It was a really good example, and you can get some ideas about layout. I'll email you the details. Thanks, that would be great. So, do I need to choose some headings? Yes, you can look at the learning objectives for the course to get ideas about that. There's a list of different things which you could discuss in each section. Evidence of problem solving, understanding of organisational structure, evaluation of training and so on. OK, that's kind of clear. So. Can I write a draft and then get some feedback from you? Well, like all written work, I can only give you feedback on 20% of it. So I suggest that you write a couple of sections and I'll look at that. Thanks, that'll help a lot, just to let me know if I'm on the right track. Also, there's another great place to check suggestions, get feedback and bounce ideas around, and that's the online forum. All of your classmates are posting and can answer any questions you have. And getting into a discussion online is a great way to develop your thoughts further. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. Thanks, you've given me a lot to get on with. Oh, one last thing. Make sure that after you've finished, you get somebody else to proofread it for you. If you do it yourself, then you might miss things. I always recommend that my students swap papers to look for errors and make suggestions. OK, will do. Thanks a lot, Sarah. No problem. I look forward to seeing what you come up with. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Part 4. You will hear part of a lecture about a mind management model in sports psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon, and thanks for attending the lecture so late on a Friday. I'm sure you'll all agree that to succeed in sports, not to mention attend a late Friday afternoon lecture, one needs not only physical strength, but also psychological fitness. We'll be discussing sports psychology today, specifically the work of an English psychiatrist working in elite sport, Professor Steve Peters. In 2005, Peters began working with the British cycling team, applying his mind management model to many a gold-winning Olympiad before publishing a book, The Chimp Paradox, in 2012, with the aim of helping us understand how mind affects body. We'll be discussing the connection between the two, along with what on earth it has to do with chimps. First, let us consider the human brain as seven separate yet connected brains. Three of these form our psychological mind, and these are focused on in the chimp paradox, frontal, limbic, and parietal, or respectively, human, chimp, and computer. Peter's mind management model views the chimp as primitive working in unending battle with the human part. This is due to the differences in nature between them, which, although both compose important parts of you, do not always see eye to eye, meaning any supposed synergy between the two is often lacking or missing altogether. The chimp part of the brain is responsible for irrational thought and overly emotional thinking based on perceptions of our inadequacies and paranoia not being good enough, smart enough, rich enough, good-looking enough. The list goes on. However, the chimp isn't all bad. It can be responsible for good, positive feelings, those that motivate us and drive us to action. And herein lies the paradox, quoted from Peters. The chimp can be your best friend and your worst enemy. Trying to get on with a chimp is the human part of our brain. This is the sensible part of us, basing its decision on evidence, rationality. It sees things in perspective. It exercises self-control and compassion. In short, it follows the rules. And I think it's easy to see why these huge differences between the two brains can make for internal conflict. Lastly, the computer. This is the chimp and human's external hard drive, their storage unit, if you will, which takes information from the former two brains and files it. It can later be used independently of the previous two brains as a reference point. I'm sure we'd all agree that these emotions the chimp is responsible for cannot be magically removed, as does Peter's. What he does suggest, though, are ways to maximize ourselves, the human, and manage the chimp along with our happiness, and with regards to sporting dreams, achieve the unachievable. Let's look at some famous examples of Peter's theory and practice. Okay, so our first example. Victoria Pendleton, the now double Olympic gold medal cyclist, was on the verge of giving up on her cycling dreams before she met Professor Peters after years of constant training showed no tangible improvements and had left her feeling like a failure. Having taught her techniques to reframe events in her mind, Peters helped her control her emotions and make positives from negatives with astounding results. Although she admits she would never have become world champion nine times or achieved numerous other career triumphs without the model, she states she was not transformed overnight. Peters has not only worked within cycling. British snooker player Ronnie O'Sullivan has also sought his help in the past, 
A child snooker prodigy, O'Sullivan turned professional at the age of 16, but has found his life daubed with bouts of serious clinical depression. For O'Sullivan, labeled a perfectionist and being highly self-critical, Peters seemed the ideal person to approach for help. Indeed, Peters has helped him to overcome his negative emotions through use of the chimp model. I think both of these examples show how the mind affects the body, either positively or negatively, for all of us. But especially within the professional sporting context, it can be the difference between success or failure, between continuing or giving up the discipline. Now, in preparation for our end-of-term essay, I'd like you all to research an example of psychology on sporting performance. You could even consider your own chimp and how it affects your behavior as an exercise, too. Oh, and I forgot to mention, you must give your chimp a name. Moving on to the history of the sports psychologist. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.